Let us pray together. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. So make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, we pray. Amen. Paul gives good advice on how to live in our relationships with one another to make sure that they remain healthy and caring and mutual. In another passage in the Gospel of Matthew, reading from chapter 18, Jesus also gives advice, but this time on how to heal relationships that are broken. Listen to God's word from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. If another member of the church sins against you, then go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, then you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. If the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, truly I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the many things that the pandemic season has taken away from us is the normal pattern of commencements. Those graduation events in which presidents and valedictorians and celebrities exhort the graduating seniors to think big, to strive for the stars. They're told they should imagine world peace, they should stop climate change, they should work to cure diseases, they should try to end poverty and hand off a better planet to their children than what has been given to them by their elders. Sometimes Henry David Thoreau is quoted where he said, if you build castles in the air, you, your work need not be lost, for that is where it should be. Now put the foundations under them. Graduation speeches encourage us to dream, to strive for goals, to practice the art of thinking big. But there's also an art of thinking small, you don't hear about it much at commencements, but it's very real and important. Thinking small is the art of paying attention to small details, of honoring even minor obligations and working to keep all of our promises. It's that attentiveness that parents discover within themselves when their infant begins to crawl and suddenly you notice everything that he or she is going to try to put in their mouth. Or when you bring a new puppy home and you watch the dog from a distance and constantly have to ask yourself, what is that dog chewing on now? It's the art of counting out exact change to give to a cashier. It's using a little tiny screwdriver to fix the loose screw on your eye frame, eyeglass frames. It's taking time to listen to every word a child says to you, to listen when your parents are asking something of you, or to take time to hear the questions posed to you by strangers you might meet on the street. The art of thinking small, I read somewhere famous, is like when a shepherd leaves a larger group of 99 sheep in order to find the one lamb that's gone astray. It's like that tiny mustard seed that's put in the soil, but in time it becomes a bush large enough for birds to build their nests within it. Jesus Christ actually talked a lot about the art of thinking small. And he sometimes did it in surprising ways in passages that never used the word small at all. Like in the passage we heard 
from Matthew chapter 18. On the surface, the verses I read from the gospel sound less like scripture and actually sound more like something you might read in one of those human resource manuals at a big company. Because the passage goes like this. If someone sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. And if they listen to you, well then, you've regained a friend. If you're not listened to, well then take one or two others with you so that every word can be confirmed by evidence. And if the person still refuses to listen, well then tell it to the entire church. It's sad to imagine that church conflict is as old as the scriptures of the church, but then churches are made up of people and people have always been prone to disagree with one another. Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, once famously said, if you can't say something nice about someone else, then come sit right next to me. To adapt another biblical metaphor, seeds of faith are planted and they they take root inside a church. But sometime in those same gardens, those same churches, weeds of jealousy and disagreement and envy crowd in and suffocate the young seedling before they can bear fruit. So I want us to consider carefully Jesus' advice on conflict resolution and church conflict resolution. First, Jesus wants us to think small and keep conflict contained to the smallest appropriate group. If one person sins against you, then talk to that person when you're alone. Despite what Alice Roosevelt has said, we actually shouldn't spread gossip. We shouldn't tell others how we've been offended by that person's action in the hope to build a coalition around us who will stand beside us and affirm that we're the one that's been wronged. If a disagreement emerges, as far as it's possible, then find a way to keep a problem that's between two people to just between those two people. Find a time to talk face to face Find a way to listen carefully. And above all, seek reconciliation. And that's actually the second important point that Jesus lifts up. The goal of this thinking small art of conflict resolution is that you are seeking reconciliation. It's not to prove that you were right and the other person was wrong. It's to do what you can to bring about restoration and healing. It's to welcome the lost sheep back into the fold. It's opening the doors widely so whomever has felt ostracized or marginalized or pushed out can actually faithfully be welcomed back in. Sometime read again what the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12 when he he talks about how the church is a body made up of many members And the members rely on each other, so much so that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the stronger members cannot say to the weaker members, we see no reason why you're here. Wherever there's division, we're called to talk to one another, to seek peace and reconciliation. Now later on, if a wise friend can help act as a mediator, well, then all the better. If two friends can come along to ensure that everyone's position is going to be heard and well-respected, well, that's also good too. And if all that doesn't work, then frankly, a hard and a faithful conversation needs to happen that involves the entire church. But remember, it's not a trial of that one person who's accused of wrongdoing, but it's an honest conversation that begins by asking ourselves, how is it possible that through our own activities and choices, one person has led astray? How might our self-interest, and honestly, how might our sins have caused this break in the body of Christ? 
It's in the art of looking carefully and humbly at ourselves that we are able to see with the eyes of Christ and then act for peace in our relationships with one another within the church and frankly in the world around us. As you are all well aware, in just under two months, we will have our next presidential election. And already things are quite tense. The language of division, of us versus them, is quite rampant. After the 2016 election, our session at a couple meetings had some hard and honest conversations around the table because not everyone had voted for the same candidate. And some challenged the messaging that they had heard prior to the election from the pulpit and from the pews beside them. And so as one way to better practice what we preach, our session then put a call out to a Presbyterian congregation in Zelianople, Calvin Presbyterian Church. And we found two occasions to sit down together for a meal and for an honest discussion about the ways the election of 2016 had caused division and conflict, not only within the church, but within their lives and their families. It was a wonderful opportunity. I heard perspectives and opinions and ideas that I hadn't heard before. And we gained a new level of trust between us. Well, a week from this coming Tuesday, part of our session is again going to meet with Calvin Presbyterian Church in Zelianople. Our hope is to rekindle our friendship and to talk honestly about our hopes and our fears as we approach another election cycle. If before we were reactive, this time we're choosing to be proactive. And it's going to be admittedly just a small conversation through Zoom. And given the war of words in America, it may not seem like much, but Christ calls us to think small, to act faithfully, to nurture those relationships even when there's only a few involved. And that's the last bit of wisdom from this passage. I want you to notice that Jesus never says, I'll be with you once you fill up the halls of the mega churches and once all the pews are packed with new converts. No, Jesus actually says, where two or three are gathered in my name, then I'll be there among you. Where two people sit down to talk through a disagreement, and work towards healing a broken relationship, Christ is there. Where three people honestly discuss one another's hurts and fears and name their longing for healing in their mutual life, then Christ is there. And when a small group can come together around a table where there's a simple buffet of juice and bread, then somehow wonderfully, mystically, and joyfully, Christ is present. And that's his promise for us. And that's our greatest comfort as we walk wherever the road ahead might happen to lead us. The author Madeline Lingell once said, quote, It is easier to be cosmic than to be particular. Now, of course, we'd rather have something dramatic and spectacular, so we tend not to see the small opportunities for peacemaking that are presented to us every day. But their smallness does not make them lesser opportunities, unquote. Friends, there's a definite art to thinking small. Smallness as in one-on-one -on -one conversations, a smile given to a tired worker, a moment of real attention offered to a frustrated child, an honest effort to repair a broken friendship, a sincere word or prayer spoken out of love and genuine concern. They all may seem like such small things, but of such is the kingdom of God, right here and right now. Amen.